to welcome everybody to the award ceremony for the new School of Humanities. What we're here to do tonight is to celebrate our fantastic student cohort, the ones that actually have um, gone above and beyond. Uh, we love all our students. We think they're all brilliant, but there are the ones that win prizes, and that's who we're here to celebrate tonight. Uh, we couldn't do any of this, and as you can see from the names of some of our prizes, without uh, the amazing donors and benefactors who have contributed um, their time and also their cash to actually support some of these things. Uh, a few of them are here tonight, uh, not all of them, but uh, I want to give a big shout out to the Aisling Society of Sydney, the Australasian Pioneers Club, and this Theosophical Society in Australia, who are actually going to be um, supporting and also presenting some of the prizes. Um, we've welcomed in the new school uh, two new disciplines. Um, there's a long list of them there you can see, but the two new ones that we are very um, happy to have and, uh, and beginning to work with and, and uh, enjoy are linguistics and studies in religion. And the only downside to that this evening is that it's going to take a bit longer to actually go through all the names because we have a few more students. So uh, it'll be a bit longer to, to get to the fizzy at the end. So at the end of this uh, torturous ceremony, hopefully it won't be too bad, um, there will be, uh, we would love you to join us for drinks and some um, high class nibbles, hopefully, uh, in this great venue. Um, we have a lot of awards and prizes to hand out, obviously. There are bathrooms over there for later, also upstairs. There are male bathrooms, additional male bathrooms, which you can also access through um, those stairs. So join us later for not just the, uh, the formal bit, and we try and keep it as informal as, po as possible, but also for the, the social bit and the celebratory bit and the, the drinking and nibbles bit. So to start with, unless I've missed anything out, and I'm sure I'll be told pretty soon if I did, I'd like to introduce the Deputy Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences within which the School of Humanity sits, to say a few words. Um, I'd like to welcome Professor Gary Barrett, who is actually not from the School of Humanities. He is an economist. Silence, it's Gary. But tonight he's going to be embraced and, and, and get into the warm bath of the humanities, coming over from the dark side into the light. Gary. Thank you, Keith, for the introduction. I too would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land in which we are meeting this evening, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. We meet on lands that were never sold or ceded. This has been a site of learning for many thousands of, of years. I wish to pay respects on behalf of all present to elders past, present and emerging. As Deputy Dean of FAS, I'm delighted to be here and to also welcome you to the School of Humanities Student Award Ceremony, which celebrates the achievements of the students of the humanities during 2022. I especially welcome the award recipients, their proud families, friends, colleagues and friends of the school. I'd also like to acknowledge the donors who are great supporters of the humanities and have sponsored student prizes and a number have been able to join us tonight which is terrific for colleagues across the faculty the annual student award ceremony is a highlight of the academic year it's a special event where we come together to acknowledge the achievements of the students that we teach as an educator at sydney it is a privilege to teach the very talented students who have chosen to study with us at the university and tonight we acknowledge the exceptional performances by students studying a range of disciplines that compose the school. And these are drawn from a very talented cohort. And as Keith touched on, they've endured the disrupted learning environments over the past several years. So their performances are truly exceptional. Since the early 2020s with the onset of the pandemic, we've changed the way we deliver our teaching programs. Students have had to adapt the way that they learn. It is great that we re are returning more activities to campus. There's more face-to-face -face classes and with that peer-to-peer -peer learning. So that has been tremendous. And there's a renewed understanding of the benefits of that. Our award recipients have successfully navigated through those disruptions and the results are truly outstanding. We also wanted to acknowledge the outstanding work of the academic and professional staff who composed the School of the Humanities, led by the head of school, Professor Keith Dobney, these are an amazing group of dedicated educators. They do deliver a contemporary curriculum. They're passionate about their disciplines and ensuring that they deliver 
and enriching learning experience for the students who study humanities at Sydney. And with that, I'd like to hand back to Keith so we can proceed to acknowledge these students. Thanks, Gary. So just uh, a heads up in how this is going to work. We're going to go through uh, the prizes for each individual by discipline. I think it's in alphabetical order, so that's pretty straightforward. And we'll ask them to come up on the stage. Um, the chair of the discipline will um, give a few words. I will hand out some certificates. And the winners, we want to take a photograph at the end. And rather than bring them all back and get confused within the seating, we'd like to keep them on the stage. So sorry, the first one up here is going to have to stand for a while. Um, and we'll find a way to um, get them all uh, a photograph at the end and then go back to your seats. There's a big gap at the back of the stage, so just be a bit mindful. That's a health and safety nightmare waiting to happen, but um, I will keep an eye on that with a bit of luck. So as Gary kindly said, I am the head of a brilliant school with some fantastic colleagues. And um, the first discipline um, that we would like to award and, and uh, a prize is to is archaeology, which amazingly is my subject. So I'm very happy, not biased, but very happy to introduce the chair of archaeology, Professor Alison Betts. Alison. Thank you, Keith, and good evening. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be here tonight to present prizes to our stellar students. Uh, it's not the first time I've had the honor of doing it, but it's always a wonderful thing to do. It's always thrilling to see a new generation of young people excited to follow the path that I and my colleagues have enjoyed for, in my case at least, almost a lifetime. Uh, we're also greatly fortunate to benefit from the generosity of our donors who believe so much in the value of the discipline of archaeology and the encouragement of our graduates. Many thanks to all, and I hope that others will follow. Archaeology is such a rich discipline. It's the study of everything that has and does make us human. Our students are multi-talented with expertise in so many different fields of inquiry. To find our answers, we have to delve into biology, zoology, anthropology, art, ethics, architecture, climate, agriculture, and on and on and on with an endless list. Archaeology has something for everyone, no matter what your special talents and interests. And we're a fieldwork discipline. Fieldwork gives our students the opportunity to learn self-sufficiency, maturity, and independence, to work with people of other cultures and languages, to be out of doors if they like, or in the laboratory if that's what they prefer. It builds confidence and a broad understanding of the world around them, and it can also offer them real jobs. While some aim for jobs in museums, galleries, and universities, there is also a strong call for trained professionals in the heritage industry in Australia and overseas. So we don't yet know where our prize winners tonight are headed, but we wish them well, and we hope that they prosper as they move forward in archeology span or elsewhere. So I would like now to get Keith to start to award the prizes. So our first, prize is the Frank Albert Prize for Prehistoric and Historical Archaeology, which has been won by Megan Porter. Megan. Megan. The Graduate's Prize in Prehistoric and Historical Archaeology, Summer Maybon. The J.R.B. Stewart Prize in Near Eastern Archaeology, Bradley Arsenault. It's jointly awarded with Jesse Cross, who is unable to attend. You've got to keep clapping and silence. <laughs> the Marcel Rosina Whitehouse Prize in Archaeology is again jointly awarded to Jessica Chandy and Sarah Lewis. The Max Le Petit Memorial Prize for Classical Archaeology, Saskia Rees.
Can I ask the students to run to the stage, please? <laughs> the Rob Thornley Memorial Prize um, has been awarded to Mei Shi Huang. Mei Shi is unable to attend. The Thomas James Dunbabin Memorial Prize in Archaeology has been won by Frederick Jolly, also unable to attend. The Carlisle Greenwell Research Scholarship to Simon Wyatt Spratt, who again is, un is unable to attend. And the Polyminia and Emilia Kalinikos Scholarship to Olympia Nelson. The Postgraduate Research Scholarship in Sri Lankan Coastal Archaeology, Martin Wright, who is also unable to attend. And in addition, we have uh, two awards which have been given to uh, members of the, uh, or students, who with awards funded by the Near Eastern Archaeology Foundation, and they will not be handed out, but we will announce them. Uh, the Catherine Southwell Keeley Travel Grant to Holly Winter, and the NIF grant in aid to Francis Wig and Holly Winter. And that ends the Archaeology Awards. Thank you very much. You got to go there, Alison. Alison hasn't read the script properly. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, brilliant. Well done, guys. Absolutely brilliant. Proud parents can whistle and whoop if they want to. I won't be offended, I promise. So moving on to our next uh, fantastic discipline, um, let me introduce Professor Peter Wilson from the discipline of classics and ancient history to present their prizes. Peter. Really uh, thank, you. Great. Uh, thank you, Keith. Um, students, family, friends of students, benefactors and supporters, Deputy Dean and colleagues. Um, this is, for me, truly the brightest event on the entire academic calendar. Unlike one or two others, it is an absolutely unalloyed pleasure. It's an opportunity to celebrate the achievements of our wonderful students, to recall and reflect on the contribution, small or great, that we made as teachers, because as uh, Gary Barrett said, it's the great reward of teaching at a university such as this in enabling the best really to flourish. It's also an opportunity to recall and reflect on the contribution that our friends beyond the university have made to our endeavors. And I think here of supportive families of our students, above all in the extremely difficult climate of contemporary higher education with all its costs and anxieties, but also of our benefactors past and present. We're fortunate in classics and ancient history to have a tradition of such benefaction that is as old as the university itself, and also as young as the university in that we have new prizes awarded in recent years from benefactors such as Mr. Joy Deep Hoare and his family who support the Dipak and Shanta Hoare prize. But I was thinking one or two others from the further past on my way here. One of them, um, Daniel Cooper, is one of our very earliest supporters of our field. He was the first speaker of the Legislative Assembly in 1856. The next year, 1857, he was elected to the Senate of the university. He was also the nephew of another Daniel Cooper, who had been transported as a convict to Botany Bay uh, for larceny in 1815. And in those few facts, there's a whole sort of colonial story uh, embedded. In 1860, Daniel Cooper wrote a note to the university saying, I beg to enclose a check for 1,000 pounds, which I wish to be applied for the purpose of founding a scholarship for proficiency in classical literature under such rules and regulations as the Senate of the Sydney University may think proper to make. Well, that thousand pounds has since generated literally hundreds of prizes and dozens of traveling scholarships that have taken graduates from this university over to Cambridge, Oxford, Princeton, other places, and set them in many cases on their way to being leaders in their field. The other person I wanted to remember briefly was William Ritchie, who is a teacher of mine uh, here in University of Sydney, and my predecessor is Professor of Greek. Bill Ritchie was a man of incredibly modest ways and almost pathological frugality. Uh, he devoted himself entirely to his subject and his students, and 
it was on one way a great surprise and on reflection no surprise at all that when he died he left his entire estate to the university to found as chair of Greek and support the study of classics more generally. So I waved the shadow of Daniel Cooper and William Ritchie and our other benefactors past and present. But of course, the real stars here are our awardees, our students. I had the enormous pleasure last week of teaching a group of Greek students uh, about the poet Pindar, uh, the greatest lyric poet of classical antiquity. And we read, as it happened, that what's deemed to be his greatest poem, the first Olympian ode, which begins, Ariston men hudor, best is water. And it goes on, and gold, like a blazing fire in the night, stands out supreme of all lordly wealth. But if, my heart, you wish to sing of contests, look no further for a star warmer than the sun that shines by day through the lonely sky, and let us not proclaim any contest greater than the Olympian. How, I hear you ask, might this be relevant to us gathering here? Well, anyone who reaches the point of being able to read the complex Greek of Pindar in his weird Boeotian choral Greek deserves a prize, and I'm hoping there's one or two people who've done that here on our list. For those of you who, um, for whom this is first contact with Pindar the Theban, if it was a bit strange and bewildering, don't worry. The first person who wrote an English translation of Pindar, Abram Cowley, in the 17th century, after the experience wrote that if a man should attempt to translate Pindar literally, it would be thought that one raving madman had translated another. But Pindar is also relevant, I think, to this evening, because even though he was regularly commissioned by the most powerful people in all of Greece to write songs about their athletic achievements, it's completely obvious on the most minimal contact with Pindar that he had absolutely no interest whatsoever in sport. He takes every opportunity he can to avoid singing about wrestling, jumping, horse racing, chariot tearing, throwing the javelin. And instead, he concentrates all of his extraordinary energies to reflect on the meaning of human excellence and human limits, and especially on the crucial value of Sophia, of wisdom, or for him, poetry, culture, the sort of things that our students have devoted their energies to over the last few years and at times with uh, not a particularly uh, supportive environment around them. So with Pindar, let me pass on my very warmest congratulations to prize winners this evening. You have well and truly earned your garlands. So I'll now call upon Professor Dobney to award the prizes for classics and ancient history. And the first of them is the Ancient History Senior Essay Prize to Hannah Moore. The Britta Petzl Memorial Prize in Ancient History goes to Fenella Palanca. <laughs> Until they reach the stage of it. The David Ritchie Prize for 1000 level Latin goes to Alexander Campbell. Good job. The David Ritchie Prize for 2000 level Latin goes to Elsa Tonkinwise. <laughs> Getting more and more elegant. Absolutely. These are Olympians after all, not in classical sports. The David Ritchie Prize for 3000 level classics goes to Jules Val. The Dibak and Shanta Hoare Prize to Roxanne Lochland. <laughs> the Eileen Gronewigan Prize in Classics and Ancient History to Elizabeth McTaggart. Frederick Spencer Burnell Prize for the best essay in Greek two or three to John Zafiropoulos, who's unable to attend, and to Declan Zamet, who I believe is with us. Declan. Declan. Maybe not. The Frederick Lloyd Memorial Prize to Hannah Moore, already on the stage.
the June Hartnett Prize for Proficiency in Second Year Ancient History to Hong Yuan Wang. The Leonie Hain Ancient History Junior Prize to Elsa Tonkinwise. <laughs> the Max Le Petit Memorial Prize for Classical Greek to Alexander Campbell. <laughs> the Miltiadis and Alkistis Chrysavgis Prize for Biblical Greek to Jonathan Lee, who's unable to be here. The Nicholson Medal to Molly Blackburn. The Roderick and Janet West Prize to Alexandra Duke Young. The W.J. Woodhouse Memorial Prize for Ancient Greek to Peter Tarion. The Daniel Cooper Postgraduate Research Scholarship and Teaching Fellowship goes to Kimberly Harris, who's unable to be here. <clears throat> and the last prize, Woolley Memorial Research Scholarship in Classics to Jack Pash. Oh, sorry. Tallest ones at the back. Hey, Jimmy, you've got to be in there, aren't you? <laughs> Let me get out of the way. Brilliant. Thank you to everybody. Fantastic. Yeah, you take that. Okay. And so I have to invite Hannah Moore. Just to invite Hannah. That's right. Hannah is going to say a few words. Uh, 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 not about all the prizes she's got, but hopefully our experience with classics and ancient history in the school, right? Hello, everyone. I apologize beforehand if my voice dies. I'm still recovering from a flu. Um, I'm not still contagious, though. <laughs> um, but hello, everyone. I took a bit of a risk when I chose to uh, study ancient history at university. I'm sure that many of us in this room tonight have heard others say, arts what kind of job can you get with that and the reason why i chose to study ancient history and the answer that many of us have to that question of why is actually quite simple and it's because i like it i find the ancient world and the process of understanding it interesting and fascinating and i think that this is one of the reasons why the classics in ancient history cohort is such a great bunch of people while my classmates and i would often complain about assignments at the end of the day, we all took the risk to choose to study something that we are interested in, what we are passionate about, rather than what has the biggest paycheck. I got to study alongside people who were really invested in their study because they were passionate about it. And this passion and interest, which many of us think crazy to pursue, is what's needed in our discipline. I don't think I could have learned the numerous complicated grammatical rules of dead languages and the subsequent thousand and one exceptions to those rules if I didn't have any passion for it. And I certainly would not have been able to read hundreds of pages of ancient readings and modern texts that was required just for a single essay. This kind of passion is seen in our professors as well, many of whom have spent years studying specific and niche areas of the ancient world that I didn't even know existed. So as I continue my studies in secondary teaching, I hope to take this interest and passion for the ancient world and for our discipline, which has grown and has been shared with by my peers and professors into the high school classroom. I hope to nurture future generations of classics and ancient history students and kindle in them the passion that has brought us all here today. Thank you very much. I'm not sure I could have said anything better than that, to be fair. I think you're absolutely right. Do the things you love and are passionate about, and you will be great at them. 
and you will learn all kinds of other skills too. So great subjects. Okay, on to the next great subject, uh, gender and cultural studies. And I'd like to introduce, um, wherever he is, Guy, the chair of the discipline. <laughs> Thanks, Keith. When's the first paycheck? <laughs> oh, dear. Um, well, thanks very much. Um, it's really an honor and pleasure to be in this forum as a chair for the first time. Um, and to honor our outstanding students and to uh, thank our donors. I'd like to congratulate all the recipients, of course. Um, I know how hard you've worked, um, what it means to be a high performing student and all the hours you put in and all the other commitments you have in your lives, etc. cetera. Um, just really well done. Um, it's so nice to be involved in giving you these well-earned um, awards tonight. Uh, especially, of course, as uh, all of you have studied and achieved uh, what you've achieved through the COVID period. Um, hopefully that's winding up now, that kind of interruption to education. Um, but it's been really outstanding to see how people have kept their passions alive during that period. And before um, giving out the prizes, I'd just like to say a couple of things about uh, gender and uh, cultural studies. Um, sort of, you know, I think there's a question of what is it that our particular cohort of students are outstanding at? And if I was to say something about gender and cultural studies, I'd probably emphasize the breadth. Um, clearly, it's not a vocational subject like most of our humanities disciplines, um, but it's very broad. It's almost like we specialize in studying everything because there's a gender dimension or a cultural dimension to everything. So quite often our students have that broad set of interests. They, they, might be, they might have certain passions in the world. They might be animated by a sense of mission, uh, you know, profound commitments to issues around social justice are quite common in our cohort, trying to understand and grapple with the issues that we face as communities, as human communities. So in a sense then we're very, very broad, but we apply everywhere. So when I think to myself, what is, what is it that we cultivate and what is it that our students have cultivated so in such an outstanding way that we give them a prize tonight? Um, that's really, you know, the common link is a passion to engage with our world and really to uh, become a person who reflects on what it means to be in this world in what, whatever context and way that that might apply. So our main output, is awareness, enhanced awareness, I think. Um, our students embody this, they're outstanding at understanding the possibilities of our world. And they're driven by a sense of who we are, who others are, and how we can fashion things together to enrich all our lives. So in those terms then, it's a matter of profound satisfaction um, for me to award these prizes tonight and to know that these outstanding students are so well placed to continue that kind of passion and commitment in whatever they may do to their gender and cultural studies major. That's it for me. So then now we do the, the names and I'm afraid I don't know everybody. And we, I'm starting with the prize for uh, outstanding achievement in first year cultural studies. Um, somebody I haven't met and unfortunately is unable to attend, and that is Malayika Russell. <laughs> Our prize for outstanding achievement in first year gender studies goes to Oli Mokoslan. Our prize for outstanding achievement in uh, second year cultural studies goes to Eva Tier. <laughs> uh, 
Our prize for outstanding achievement in third year cultural studies goes to Julie Nguyen. A prize for outstanding achievement in third year gender studies goes to Rebecca Levick, who's unable to attend. A prize for outstanding achievement in gender and cultural studies honors goes to Darcy Morgan. And finally, um, oh, sorry, no. Last but one, um, our Vera Edith Thorpe Prize in second year gender studies goes to Gwendolyn Dabaja. <laughs> and the one I almost forgot is something we've uh, been able to offer for the last couple of years due to a generous new donation. And that is the Postgraduate Equity Scholarship in Gender and Cultural Studies, and that goes to Sertan Saral, who's unable to attend. Thanks, Guy. Very okay. Well. Yep. Okay. We're allowed to get a look. Thank you. Round of applause for everybody. <laughs> Now my notes are all mixed up, so I'm assuming that next is definitely history. So let me introduce Mike, Mike McDonald, Chair of Discipline of History, who was here earlier. Oh, there he is, sneaking up on the side. Hey, Mike, over to you. Sitting at the back with the bad kids. Relaxing. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming out to support these brilliant students tonight. It's one echoing Peter is one of my favorite evenings of the year, and it's wonderful to have so many here to celebrate in person with us. But I won't mince words, as usual. We have increasingly fewer occasions to celebrate these days. History and the humanities are under attack, make no mistake. Attack from within the university in part, but mostly from without. The government, labor's not doing much to help, are stripping funding increasing fees and demanding job ready graduates in this context what's the point in encouraging and giving students choices and free reign to study medieval religious texts or the criminal underworld of 20th century sydney what jobs are these students ready for what can they possibly do fortunately these amazing students here tonight are our best defense against myopic questions and presumptuous answers Collectively, they've shown an extraordinary ability to tackle new subjects and approaches. Some have grappled with the long sweep of the history of war of, or of sex scandals or of enslaved labor and systemic racism. They have also done so in an amazing variety of ways. Some have excelled in unpacking a single historical source, situating it in time and place and teasing out its significance in a brilliant miniature cameo. Some stride boldly across centuries, tracing and comparing themes across time. Others have worked with contemporary community organizations to enrich their histories and the public record. And in doing so, they have drawn on a vast and eclectic toolbox filled, historians freely confess, with borrowed tools. They may need to be skilled and critical readers of the media. They may have to analyze art and material artifacts. They may seek to decode the language of international diplomacy, understand the operation of class, explain the causes of war, explore the significance of gender, or trace the evolution of, of an idea. So we are immensely proud of all the students here tonight because in an already demanding degree, they have stood out from the crowd. In a broad, eclectic, and always shifting discipline, these students have impressed multiple academics who hold differing, different interests, values, and approaches, and they have achieved outstanding results in all of the units that they have taken, not just the ones they're winning prizes for. They have demonstrated range, versatility, and depth, and they've also displayed with great consistency the qualities that all of us value the most. Curiosity, motivation, industry, deep critical engagement with primary and secondary sources, 
a high level of conceptual understanding and independent analytical thought and luminous skills of argument and communication. In doing so, these students have transformed themselves and have transformed us as their teachers as well. And therein lies the brilliance and the terror for some of the job ready history graduate. For the same tools we hone and sharpen to help us prize open the past are the same tools we need to understand and question society and ideas in the present. These students are indeed not ready for this or that particular job. And I'm sorry, we failed you in that respect. But they are ready and willing to, to, as Hannah mentioned, to take risks, to tackle any job or career, but to tackle any problem in society, any crisis facing us, to think on their feet and ask the hard questions and bring these skills to bear in answering them, to transform, to change, and make this world a better, fairer, and more equitable place to live. And for that, we are proud of them, their parents, families, and friends should be proud of them, and they should be immensely proud of themselves. Well done to all. And now to the prizes. We've got a lot, sorry, we've gone quickly. Um, we've got the AE Tony Kyle History Prize, uh, which goes to Edward Morgan. Edward. Okay. Now we've got two prizes that I'd like to introduce uh, Tony Earls of the Ashling Society to come up, uh, our benefactor to award this uh, prize. The Ashling Society of Sydney Prize for an essay on Irish or Irish Australian history, uh, which was split this year between Thomas Cafe. Yay. And Alexander Sorry, Panzerino. Sure. Thank you, Tony. And I would also like to invite up on stage John Lancer and Chris White of the Australasian Pioneers Club to award the prize in, for the Australasian Pioneers Club Prize. And this prize goes to Alexa, Alexi Hamilton, sorry. Stage well, right now. Like Thank, Thank, Thank you. Next up, we have the Charles Brunsden Fletcher Prize for Pacific History, which was won by Alexander Frost, who is unable to attend. We have the Charles Trimby Burfitt Prize for the study of Australian history prior to 1900, and that goes to Brianna Johnson. And the Ernest Bramstead Prize for modern or medieval European history, which goes to Patrick Flood. We have the George Arnold Wood Memorial Prize for History One, and that goes to Maya Retallick. <laughs> and the George Arnold Wood Memorial Prize for History Two, which goes to Rosemary Hearn.
And we have the GS Caird Scholarship in History too, and this was split among three really brilliant students. It was very difficult and we didn't like to uh, try and reward as many students as possible. So uh, let me welcome to the stage Charlotte Greenhall, Rosemary Hearn again, and Owen McKittrick. We have the Helen Newborn Bennett Memorial Prize for Senior History, and that goes to Angela Zhu. And we have a couple of History Department prizes, one for outstanding work in one of our capstone units, History 3901, it goes to Kasia Hinkle, who is unable to attend tonight. Uh, and History Department Prize for Outstanding Work in History 3902, History Beyond the Classroom, that goes to Darcy Campbell. <laughs> and the History Department Prize for Outstanding Work in History 3903, uh, History and Historians, Olivia Lane. And another History Department Prize for an outstanding essay on a subject relating to social justice and or social inclusion. And this goes to Claire Soleil. But wait, there's more. Um, if some of the prizes are not quite clear for what, uh, uh, for the reasons they're being awarded, uh, if you haven't figured it out already, there is at the back of the program a, a, a longer description of each of the prizes. The next one is the Isabel M. King Memorial Prize for History Three, and that also goes to Darcy Campbell. <laughs> and we have the J. H. M. Nolan Memorial Prize for Proficiency in History, and that goes to Victoria Ewan. And we have the Maud Stiles Memorial Prize in Senior History, and that was split between Susan Bishop and Victoria Gillespie, both winners. <laughs> and we have the Philip Erdos Prize in History, which goes to Thomas Fotio. Just a couple more. Uh, Joan also postgraduate research sports scholarship, and that goes to Fang Chen Yuan. <laughs> and the John Fraser scholarship for postgraduate work to Catherine Hempstead. And, and we have the CARE Scholarship in History, uh, won by Emily Dunn, who is unable to attend. <laughs> and the Postgraduate Research Progression Scholarship in Australian History, which was won by Robin Eames, who is also unable to attend. <laughs> and we have the Postgraduate Research Search Support Scholarship in Australian History, uh, uh, one by four of our postgraduate students, uh, three of whom are unable to attend, but Peter Brownlee is here. <laughs> and also Robin Eames, Judith Roseboom, and Daniel Seaton. Um, and finally, uh, we have the Undergraduate Equity Scholarships in History, and they go to Anna Garnsey, who's unable to attend, and Jadzia Stronel, who's also unable to attend. <laughs> Many congratulations to all. Thank you. Brilliant. I can't even get him on the <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, you need to kneel down, definitely. I need to get out of the way. <laughs>
Thank you. Now, before she disappears, I'd like to invite back Darcy Campbell, winner of the History Department Prize, or two prizes, and the Isabel M. King Memorial Prize, to return and to say a few words. Thank you, Darcy. Hi, my name's Darcy and I'm a country kid. Um, so when I moved down here from a farm up north on Beer Pie Land a few years ago to study history, I quickly learned two things real fast. Firstly, that you need to wave a bus down if you actually want it to stop. As someone who grew up far away from public transport, this was like news to me and not something that comes, you know, in the Welcome to Sydney, Sydney handbooks. So I went weeks with buses zipping me by, leaving more fo Millie forlorn on the curb. But I wasn't full on for long because I eventually learned how to catch a bus properly thanks to some new friends and was able to divert my attention to my commencing history studies. So when I walked into my first ever history class, Monday 10 a.m., and saw one of my favorite historians, the Mark McKenna, sitting behind the tutor's desk, I had my second realization that I was pretty bloody lucky. Not lucky because I had moved away from the country, right? But lucky because I had grown up in a community that really valued learning and that I had a chance to, you know, consolidate that in a tertiary education. Like as a regional kid, right? I hear frequent, like frequently hear disparaging remarks about education, privilege, culture and wealth in regional Australia. And I'm guilty of making those comments myself sometimes. But as my studies in the history department have really, um, you know, helped me flesh out, I'm not lucky to have gotten out or anything like that. It's more that like regional Australia itself has so much like wealth of conversation about history, the past. And I was really lucky to bring that experience forward with me and then study that in a tertiary context. I'm a big believer that you can find history in debates wherever you look, from where to put a new commemorative plaque in the town square to the rickety mannequins of convicts at the local museum. I think ultimately, regional Australia loves rehashing the past, making at times an activity that brings communities together and at other times one that can really hurt communities and divide them when racist and colonial attitudes are exposed. And I think these ways of history are always going to continue in regional Australia, regardless of whether we continue to study them at university or not, right? Like, I think my degree has really, at the end of the day, given me the tools to uncover those conversations and an absolute commitment to learn about the past in all of its diverse forms for the rest of my life. Whether I'm sitting in a classroom listening to a brilliant UCID academic like Mark McKenna, or listening to an elder speak in an Invasion Day protest, I know that our world is so much richer, more meaningful and kinder for opening our eyes and ears to the past, whatever it looks like. I now work in history education, creating digital resources for students aged 12 to 18. I use my degree every day there to transmit these learning experiences to our next generation, uncovering the wonders, tragedies and resistances of the past with them. Whether I'm talking about the mysteries of a mummy from ancient China or on the other end of the spectrum, the horrors of the piles of suitcases left behind by victims of the Nazis at Auschwitz, I hold on to that learning opportunity with great reverence and honor, just as my teachers that here, you know, have done for me over the past few years. So to them, I say a massive thank you. As a, as a newcomer over the last few years to Australia, as you can tell from my accent, I couldn't disagree with anything that, that Darcy just said. Um, Australia is really, certainly in terms of how I study the past, the past is now here, and that's really important, which is why I think the comments by uh, both Mike and Darcy are really relevant here. Anyway, I study the past, with, and I would be biased in that space anyway. But we're going to move on to one of our new disciplines in um, School of Humanities to Linguistics, and let me invite my colleague, the chair of the discipline there, Nick Enfield. Nick. Okay. 
Hi everyone, um, it's really good to be here. So I'm in linguistics and it's a relatively new, well, just in the last year, in fact, we've joined this school. So the last time I was in this building, it was the um, kickoff, the launch of the school itself, the School of Humanities, um, which was Sophie, and we were welcomed with open arms. And uh, it's been a complete pleasure to be here at this school. And uh, I think fantastic for us and fantastic for the students to be in a uh, what I like to call a, 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 an intellectually serious environment. Uh, so that's what I really love about this school. And I think that um, the quality that we see all of the uh, uh, all of the chairs of the department talking about in our students is really a reflection of that. Um, so linguistics is, uh, as others have said about their own disciplines, one of these very broad, uh, very diverse kind of sprawling disciplines, which kind of touches on everything else. Uh, and so we, we really look at uh, the medium of all of this culture, all of this uh, history, all of this literature, human language, uh, and we're pretty ambitious in linguistics. So I remember um, as, as a student in uh, the ANU, I was in Asian studies and uh, there was a professor there, A.L. Basham, uh, who um, passed away actually before I was there, but the, there was these echoes of Basham. And uh, he used to say uh, in, in, in some kind of posh accent, uh, there's only enough time in your life for one great language. Maybe Peter can appreciate this, but you have two, so okay. Um, and it's, that's as a linguist, as someone who's being trained as a linguist, I thought, well, that's just ridiculous because uh, you know there's six, seven thousand languages spoken in the world today, uh, and um, what we really want to try to do in linguistics is understand them, uh, understand what's different about them, get to the to the root uh, of uh, human language, and figure out uh, what's at the core of all of them. Uh, and how the diversity of language can really shed light on, on what it means to be human. Um, so that's what we try to do in linguistics. We try to understand what it is about the, the massive diversity of human language, and uh, we look at it in an incredible diversity of ways. So we're looking at sound systems, we're looking at grammatical systems. Um, so naturally, our students are very diverse. They have uh, a huge range of capacities. Um, and uh, like students in the other disciplines in our school, they're just amazing. Uh, so it's fantastic to, to uh, recognize them tonight um, and to, to see them continue a real deep history of linguistics at this university. So uh, linguistics goes back a very long way. Uh, there was, before there was a linguistics department, there was a, a, our first professor of, of linguistics who was actually appointed in anthropology, uh, Capel, Arthur Capel. Uh, and indeed he is um, the, uh, he has his name on the first prize that I'm going to be presenting uh, tonight. So uh, let me turn to that. Uh, the Arthur Capel Prize for an Essay on Australian and Pacific Linguistics goes to uh, Bridie Lee, and I'm not sure if Bridie is here. Uh, I, I guess she is unable to attend. But we so. can still clap. Right? Bridie. Lee. Uh, the GS Caird Scholarship in Linguistics Two goes to Jade Robinson. The GS Caird Scholarship in Linguistics 3 goes to Lindsay Stevenson. The MAK Halliday Medal is awarded to uh, two students. Uh, one is Mark Ong, who's unable to attend. And the other is Simon Yap, <laughs> who... Simon, not here? Like it. Okay, okay. That okay, that's good, that's good, that's good. Um, and the MAK Halliday Postgraduate Research Prize uh, goes to Carly Bray, who is unable to attend. <laughs> 
So as you can see, linguistics compared to history, uh, we're a small but very punchy uh, discipline. So um, well, you've got time to grow. We've got time to grow. In the garden okay. of Sophie, sorry, Sophie, School of yeah. Humanities. So I'll get back to the bus. Thanks. <laughs> Only one photograph, Tina. So moving on now to philosophy, uh, one of our star departments and a legacy department in our um, school. Can I introduce Christy Miller, who is the chair of the discipline to um, say a few words, jump the stage and um, talk about some prizes and talk about philosophy, hopefully. Ah. Ah. So, I'm exceptionally pleased to be here tonight to celebrate all the incredible achievements of our fantastic students here. So uh, when people learn that I work, work at the University of Sydney, they often ask me, well, what do you like most about your job? And what I always say is uh, the thing about the, the to love about working at the university here is the very best of our students. And those students are not just good. They're not just very good. They're not just excellent. They're really phenomenal. So uh, here's a little bit of autobiography. I'm often sitting, you know, reading student work. And sometimes I'll have this little surreal moment where I suddenly look up and think, good Lord, I'm with this, you know, this, this paper I'm reading is fantastic. And uh, what suddenly strikes you is this is written by an undergraduate, right? Uh, it's not written by a colleague from Oxford. It's not written by a colleague from New York University. Uh, this is an undergraduate work. And it's a tremendous privilege to work with students who are of that amazing caliber, students who are passionate about the various disciplines that they uh, engage with. Uh, and of course, philosophy is a great discipline to be passionate about. We ask a ton of different stuff. Uh, we're interested in the big questions, the hard questions, not just questions about how you and I uh, fit into the world, our place, but also questions about the kind of fundamental nature of the very fabric of the world that we live in itself. So I'm exceptionally happy uh, and pleased and privileged to be here in this position today uh, to give away these prizes of students who I know the kind of work that they have done. And um, uh, so I'm, I, I'm in awe really of the, the amazing um, capacities that you guys have. So on that note, uh, so our first prize, uh, which is the Andrew Donald Campbell Memorial Prize, uh, is awarded to two people, uh, Magdalene Elmet. <laughs> and Samuel Milch. The Francis E. Snare Memorial Prize is awarded to Emily Morgan, who is unable to attend. And the GS Caird Scholarship for Philosophy 2 is also awarded to Emily Morgan, who unsurprisingly also couldn't attend in the fifth. <laughs> the John Anderson Prize for Best Thesis in Philosophy 4 goes to Sophie Morrissey. The Lithgow Scholarship number three for Philosophy One is awarded to Sam McNeil Riley. The Lithgow Scholarship number four for Philosophy Three is awarded to Lachlan Anderson. The Lucy Firth Honours Thesis Prize is awarded to Emily Baird. <laughs> and the Richard Copley Coltart and David Copley Memorial Prize in Metaphysics is awarded to uh, four people, because uh, this was a really tight one, uh, Isaac Broadhead. Edward Goodman, Ben Herzinger, 
and, and Nicole Lynn. And the time prize uh, is also awarded to Nicole Lynn. Finally, the Lucy Firth Equity Honours Scholarship is awarded to Michael Hutch, but he is unable to attend. Fantastic job, guys. Well done, guys. Got to stay back a little bit longer behind the back. Okay. Okay. In front of the wall. Can you run on the edge? Yeah. yeah, you can. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I'll now invite Ben Herzinger, who is uh, one of the winners of the Richard Copley Coltart and David Copley Memorial Prize in Metaphysics, uh, to speak to us. Ben. On behalf of the philosophy group, thank you. What if I told you that with philosophy alone, that we could prove the existence of the multiverse? and an infinite number of possible worlds, such that there is a possible world, a whole universe in the multiverse that not only contains Thor, God of Thunder, <laughs> but follows the events depicted in the Marvel movie, <laughs> Thor, to the letter. I mean, they really should have labeled the movie a documentary. I don't know what they were thinking. Sounds absolutely crazy, right? Like I'm just batshit crazy. No, it's just basic <laughs> second year metaphysics and modal logic. Philosophy has also taught me that in order to truly understand a point of view, you must understand the other point of view. That I have more questions than I have answers and that there are no right or wrong answers, only well or poorly argued ones. Unless, of course, we're talking to the philosophers of logic, the logicians, <laughs> in which case there are objectively valid or invalid arguments, but we don't talk to them much. <laughs> Nor the epistemologists, the philosophers of knowledge, lest we get into a debate about how we would even know that we know, that we know that we know, that there's even an answer to that answer. And don't get me started on the philosophers of morality, the ethicists, for whom cl there clearly are a right and a wrong answer. In all seriousness, as we look towards the future, I foresee philosophy playing a leading role in what I believe will be one of the defining challenges of our generation. That is, how will we humans deal with no longer being the most intelligent species on this planet? I'm of course referring to the future advent of artificial superintelligence. That is AI or thinking machines smarter than us. From profound questions of how we determine reality from unreality in a sea of AI generated deep fakes to how we align AI systems to human values and how we solve the hard problem of consciousness. Philosophers will be there. Thank you. Discuss. Anyway. <laughs> very, very well. We, we don't stop having conversations now about AI, and I think there are some serious issues involved, which you're absolutely right. Philosophy is gonna, has always been at the center of those. Um, ethical and moral dilemmas and also in terms of how things move forward, as are many of our disciplines. Okay, so um, while you're salivating and seeing wine being uh, uh, put on tables there, we have one, but not the least, um, one more discipline to actually introduce and call prizes. Again, a new one into the, the, uh, the school, and that's studies and religion. And let me introduce Dr. Chris Hartney, who is the chair of that discipline. Chris. Ah, head of school and fellow 
chairs of discipline and distinguished guests and award winners and ladies and gentlemen uh, it is a delight but a sad delight if I can put it that way to be here tonight uh, I uh, uh, am part of a discipline that seeks to investigate uh, the manufacture of certainty by communities and if any of those communities are more certain than any other it is the community of scholars uh, so that in the critical study of religion, we have a great job sometimes to carefully and with subtlety and listening and with great skill to negotiate uh, those who know uh, in relation to those other ones who know. And uh, so uh, this subtle progress forward in the study of uh, communities that make up our multicultural city and of course have uh, laid certainties down throughout the entire history of humanity means that those students who come to us to study have to be of a particular metal, not a religious metal, but a metal of um, subtlety, of awareness, of intellectual rigor, and of course, of a certain awareness of how to negotiate through and sometimes blast attack and uh, critically assess uh, to the full um, dimensions of their scholarly talents, uh, the certainties of others. But it's very interesting to see how some of our uh, potential scholars tonight who are getting awards have negotiated their way through that. Uh, we heard from the chair of history that uh, the humanities are under attack. Um, I can kind of second that in a very direct way, and that is that studies in religion in 2021 were slated for extinction at the University of Sydney, which would have been a great shame because uh, we're one of the last specialised departments for the critical study of religion in this part of the world. So uh, it would have been a great loss if that had have happened. Thankfully, uh, stupendous amounts of money that flowed into the university during COVID staved off um, that uh, um, blood sacrifice that may have been made <laughs> of my discipline area. And here's where the sadness comes in. When uh, we were slated for potential closure, uh, there was one student among all of our students who stood up more than any other and joined with me in fighting and that fighting was letters to fellow colleagues uh, protests on eastern avenue and a whole range of other um, dark arts that we sought to deploy against uh, against management here and that student was uh, alana louise bowden and to the shock of us all uh, uh, on uh, the monday of the long weekend in october in 2021 alana who had a, uh, a weak heart that she didn't know about um, left us. And that was uh, very confronting to have such a vigorous and bolshy student um, suddenly dead. And the last prizes ceremony I attended, uh, Elizabeth, uh, sorry, um, uh, Alana Bowden was given the Rachel McKibben prize, which is going to one of our students here tonight. And so her memory came up again, and then her memory has come up uh, even more recently when her brother and her family have made a very substantial donation to the university so that uh, next time we meet we will be awarding an Alana Bowden scholarship. Uh, we have a, a symposium uh, held in her honour coming up on the 27th of October and that scholarship will be for a PhD student who is focusing on ritual uh, religion uh, and uh, a, a sort of associated areas of the practice and the maintenance of um, religion in time and space, as it were, in, in ritual reaction. So we're, we're very happy that that's happened, but nevertheless, there is a sadness that goes with that. So I want to evoke Alana's memory again tonight and look forward to the possibility that maybe somebody in this room it doesn't necessarily have to come from either our department or from the uh, Department of Studies in Religion, may have a chance to apply for that PhD scholarship and, uh, and study in, uh, in light of what Alana had already established in her honours thesis. Um, I'd like to go through the prizes now, but read them out in a particular order. Um, first of all, I'd like to uh, uh, pay tribute to a very clever and enthusiastic student who's gone from uh, second year into third year. Uh, he is uh, attacking with vim and vigour a whole range of brave subjects in the study of religion, most recently uh, religion and poetry as it's emerging in the uh, Abbasid uh, period uh, in the development of 
uh, Islamic history, and that is Gabriel Jessup Smith. <laughs> the second prize I would like to announce uh, goes to a, a, a rare bird in, um, in Sydney, uh, a young woman who attacks with vigour the obscure and the difficult and rises to the challenge of complexities, and that is uh, Sophie uh, Vexner Shaw, who is getting the GS Caird uh, third year prize <laughs> for studies in religion. And we're absolutely delighted that Sophie is uh, going on to uh, do honours uh, and at the start of next semester. That is going to be a wonderful adventure for you, Sophie, and we're looking forward to working with you on that. The, um, the last prize which I will go to now is uh, the Rachel McKibben Prize for Outstanding Honours Thesis, and that is awarded to James Liu. And James is here. <laughs> James's honours thesis was entitled A House Divided the Thirty Years' War in France and Its Relationship to Religious Unity in Europe. Uh, and, the, and a most excellent read, James. I was one of your markers. Uh, the other marker wrote a sweeping and substantial research project. Congratulations, James. Um, the last award goes to an outstanding doctoral thesis uh, that had an esoteric dimension to it. And this goes to Fee Mosley. Uh, Fee couldn't be with us tonight. But Fee, uh, Fee's thesis title was What It Is to Belong, a Sociocultural Restoring of Women's Longing and Belonging Using Myth-Based Practices. So a, a practical dimension to the re-empowerment of women's stories in a whole range of different um, um, environments. Now, uh, Fee has been awarded the John Cooper Prize, and the John Cooper Prize is named in memory of uh, one of our former students, who was also a theosophist, and it gives me great pleasure to invite to the stage uh, um, Simon, uh, uh, Simon O'Rourke, uh, who is uh, here as Educational Officer of Theosophy Australia, just to give us a brief insight into why the Theosophical Society set this award up. Thank you, Simon. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, the Theosophical Society has been going since 1875, and Kurt Vonnegut Jr. Uh, described Madame Blavatsky, one of its founders, as the mother of the occult, occult meaning the hidden side of nature, like arcane and esoteric. And the motto of the society is, there is no religion higher than truth, which for a uh, department such as studies in religion, it's a very interesting thing that it involves more than just institutionalized religion. Sometimes we look at uh, certain expressions such as studies in religion, and we think it's about a group of theologians having coffee together, or perhaps a religious structure, but it is much more than that. It is all about the search for truth and living a life according to higher uh, laws as well. In fact, all of the disciplines that have been spoken about tonight have all been a part of ancient uh, religion, or if you like, a spiritual tradition. In fact, perhaps instead of studies in religion, it should be studies in spiritual philosophy in religion, because there's a large body of people in the world today, especially in the West, who no longer refer to themselves as being religious, they refer to themselves as being spiritual but not religious, meaning that they have a deep and abiding search for truth. The great religious philosophers, because all of the great founders of the various world traditions, world religions, were all great philosophers in their own right as well. 
and the spiritual journey is one of self transformation that's one common factor in all of these traditions and also a search for the laws relating to uh, ethics and morality not simply one person's ethics or one country's morality but the laws behind all of that and some like in the east say that there are even subtle gradations in those laws which they call dharma, meaning that there's a different law affecting all of us, but all part of this one law. And this transformation changes our lives. And this is one of the roles of religion. Without people who are living their lives according to these different traditions, we wouldn't have many of our great works of art. We wouldn't have our great uh, musical symphonies the music of Mozart, who was a Freemason, the music of Bach, Beethoven, Scriabin, and so many others were all influenced by their spiritual and philosophical ideas. If it wasn't for these ideas, we wouldn't have archaeology investigating the great pyramids and the great um, structures of old. Religion and philosophy, spirituality is such an important part of our culture. And lastly, they say a society is measured by its culture, by its compassion and its humanity. So I really do hope that all of the young people here today can find work in the outer world. It took me 40 years to find the ideal job. So it may take a while, but it is possible. And I'm really impressed by the standard of the work as well. My introduction to spirituality came through listening to Beatles records, but I can see that the, uh, the work today of investigating the various scriptures and so on is of a much higher standard. Uh, Fee Mosley, who won the Theosophical Society Prize, presented an ideal of looking at myth and storytelling as it relates to the individual. And this also touches on linguistics as well. The great spiritual scriptures of the world employ allegory to tell a story where they express uh, in symbol very deep philosophical and cosmic truths. So we're very pleased with the essay that was presented to us, which explored that idea of finding truth through storytelling and investigating the uh, quality of stories, including a story from indigenous tradition with the permission of an elder. Uh, but we we're very happy with the thesis that came from Fee. So thank you very much. You may not have heard of the Theosophical Society, but they were uh, central in bringing indie films and abstract art and the technology of radio early in the 20th century to Sydney. And they were the founders of Radio 2GB, which is the GB is for Giordano Bruno, an early um, uh, agitator of the church. Um, but uh, they sold the station in 1984 and take no responsibility whatsoever <laughs> for Ray Hadley or Ben Fordham. <laughs> right out. Um, the, um, the final thing I'd like to do is, is invite Gabrielle uh, Jessup-Smith to uh, um, provide the students rejoined. Thank you. Photo first, right? Yes, please. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm accepting this award on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I wish to extend my respect to elders past, present and emerging. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Chris and I'd like to thank Professor Carol, who isn't here, uh, for all the hard work they do in the department. Um, it's an honour and a surprise, I will admit, to be receiving this award uh, and yet I find it uh, emblematic of the encouragement and support that one can expect of the department. Within studies of religion, one finds a personal connection between staff and students like no other. Uh, the lecturers, tutors, and teachers are ever present, lending their time, support, friendly smiles, and numerous cups of coffee whenever required. As an undergrad, one feels a genuine excitement on behalf of the staff for one's education. Indeed, the passion for this subject is evident within and without the lecture hall amongst students and teachers alike. 
Often I'm met with puzzled faces when I describe my academic pursuits. Uh, do I plan on becoming a priest <laughs> is common. I might answer that studies in religion encapsulates the humanities like no other, encouraging one to understand that wide field which we name culture. We utilize methodologies from history, anthropology, sociology, psychology, literary and art criticism, the list goes on. As such, I find that my experience of studies in religion is not limited to the lecture hall, nor to the tutorial room. When I leave campus, the world is ever richer for what I learn here at the university. This is a discipline which seeks to investigate and to understand. A discipline which celebrates the diversities which enrich our country and our world. Taken seriously, the critical study of religion is ultimately a key that unlocks the door to the consciences and mentalities of the people of the world. Studying religion allows you to comprehend the very essence of what constitutes the ethical, moral, and existential heart of other people's worldviews. It's a discipline that allows you to compare the similarities and differences of not only religion, but also the cosmologies, philosophies, rituals, and practices which make up the human experience. It's a study which explores, for example, the systems which influence our national identity here at home, our education here at the University of Sydney, our politics, and our ability or our inability to celebrate and recognize our history and our diversity. Without support for this department, I fear for the value we place in understanding those systems would shape us. Uh, it's good to be here in the School of Humanities, and indeed, uh, we are different stars, but of the same spirit, to paraphrase the university motto. I paraphrase as well, Dr. Hartney, when I say one's choice of study may transform one's career, but the choice to study uh, religion will transform one's life. Well, Chris, I plan on doing both, and thank you for the opportunity to do so. Fantastic. I, I hark back to Christy saying that it's a privilege to, to teach and to learn from all these amazing students that you've heard from today. I'm uh, the head of school. I am proud as punch to be actually the head of uh, the, this school. I learn something new every day. I meet some amazing and work with some amazing people, both staff and students. And I think the key thing that I think you've heard today is the word passion regularly. Um, we all have that and our students have that in, in uh, innumerable measure. Um, and the disciplines that are part of the humanities in this university are um, as Simon kind of alluded to, really, really integrated and related. And we want to keep them not as their silos, but we want to build an understanding within and between those disciplines because we have an awful lot to share. However, the day has gone on or the evening has gone on long enough. There are drinks behind. There are, I think, some nibbles. Um, we want you to talk, socialize, enjoy, congratulate. But one last thing before we go, let's whoop, cheer, shout, whistle, whatever you want uh, to congratulate both our fantastic staff and our amazing students.